And it's been a while since I've done a laptop review and someone hit the like. It's been a while. It has been a while. What we've got right here on the table is the Razer Blade Pro 17, and it features an i7 eight cores, 16 threads. It's got a 165 Hertz IPS display, and that goes to 1440p. But of course, it is expensive. It's coming in at 2,600 USD, or in Australia, 3,500 Aussie dollars. And you're probably wondering, at this price tag, is it worth it? Should I even consider it? And I'm gonna be straight up with you guys, if you're looking for a laptop, especially at this price point, you want it to tick all the boxes and then some, because if I was spending this kind of money on a laptop, I'd want it to hit all those boxes. So let's get straight into this thing, see what it's packing, and then of course, see how it does in gaming and even things like productivity. We've got here an i7-10875H. This model in particular has 16 gigabytes of DDR4 memory at 2933 megahertz. You've got a 512 gigabyte NVMe SSD, 70.5 watt hour LiPo battery, and a 230 watt power adapter. Now as for the weights, the laptop itself weighs in at 2.77 kilograms, and the power brick will weigh in at 512 grams. So in total, roughly 3.3 kilograms if you want to travel and put it in your backpack. Though the most important part of this laptop is the GPU RTX 3070 laptop edition, of course, where it will not come in with the same FPS as an RTX 3070 desktop, but we will compare those numbers later in the video. And then we've got the 165 Hertz, where Razer are claiming we have 100% sRGB coverage. Let's get straight into testing this. We put the X-Rite iDisplay Pro and tested it, where we saw here that we got a bit over 80% sRGB coverage out of the box. And because it's an internal laptop display, there actually is no external controls or modes to change on this laptop. You have to go through Windows or different software to change the color profiles. The reds and blues were a little bit oversaturated and the greens were a little bit undersaturated but overall it wasn't really that bad you could reliably edit videos and do color work white uniformity levels did show that the bottom left hand corner was significantly out of whack in compared to the center where we saw 370 ccd brightness in the middle compared to 279 on the bottom left hand corner so white uniformity could use a little bit more quality control in this regard to pick up the brightness to a more even level across the whole panel. In terms of the backlight bleed, there was no visible backlight bleed, and that's of course thanks to the IPS-like panel, and then there was no visible cross-hatching either, where they've used actually a very nice coating on the monitor itself in terms of a semi-matte coating that still does a great job at reducing glare, especially if you're in a well sunlit room. Though now if you're a gamer, here's some of the most important news and that is the response times where I measured six milliseconds in response to the actual monitor transition times, but real response times of this monitor were around eight milliseconds. So coming a little bit over that of the refresh time. So at any given time, you'll roughly see two frames transitioning in the one frame that's being displayed on the monitor. And this is a decent result. Of course, it's not the best I've seen for an IPS panel, but it's up there and it's pretty close instead of being closer to the worst side. In terms of the input lag, we use this with the NVIDIA LDAT device where we saw here uh, roughly 16.7 milliseconds total system input lag testing over Valorant. Now moving to the gaming numbers, we've got four different titles we tested here. F1 2020 showed that we were getting some impressive results for a laptop where we're scoring 132 versus 165 on the 3070 desktop variant. Shadow of the Tomb Raider followed in a similar trend where you are losing, I would guess, around 20 to 30% depending on the title. But keep in mind, this is a laptop and it is using a lot less power than the desktop variants. When we measured the whole total system power consumption while we're gaming, it went only up to 185 watts max. And the noise was also quite well controlled, coming in around 46 decibels max, and that's with the different three locations and four fans in total, blowing air in and then all releasing it out of the back of the laptop. So I thought the cooler design and also the noise was very good considering the FPS numbers this whole laptop was putting out. And in terms of Black Ops, we saw a similar trend to the other games where we're still getting at 1440p, and this is all 1440p numbers here at high and ultra settings. We're getting 118 versus 146. And then Fortnite, we saw yet again a similar trend at 1440p epic settings. So the gaming numbers coupled in with the temperatures, coupled in with the noise, does get a good pass. And speaking of the temperatures, we went up to around mid 70 ambient environment. Now, what if you want to do some productivity on this laptop? Say for instance, you're editing videos. This is where the eight core 16 thread did a decent job. Of course, again, being a laptop component, you are using less power and you are of course going to get less power in the end. 
Spitfire. We'll pull up some Cinebench score numbers for you guys, getting 3,394 points all core, and then single core was 466. This did turbo up to 3.9 gigahertz all core on battery, and then 4.65 gigahertz single core in this particular benchmark. If you wanna do some productivity just on the battery, here's actually where some decent news does come into play with 2.2 gigahertz all core speed still being obtainable and then 3.85 gigahertz on the single core. And this did so at 27 decibels with noise. So it does remain extremely quiet on battery where it does use less power too. So if you are doing heavy work, you will get about an hour and 40 minutes out of the battery on heavy usage. If you are doing light work and just using it, say to watch some videos here and there or listen to music, you will get roughly four hours of use out of the battery and that does charge quite quickly. Though moving through the Adobe Premiere Pro numbers, you're gonna get similar results to a roughly an i5 10400, 11400F and then over to the Geekbench five numbers, again, a similar trend to the Adobe Premiere Pro numbers. Though keep in mind, if you do wanna do productivity on this, then you will want to probably upgrade the RAM from 16 gigabytes to 32 at the least. If you are doing heavy 4K video work, then you might, like me, want 64 gigabytes of RAM, which in this case, you can upgrade to 64 gigabytes. That's the maximum spec supported on the Razer Blade Pro 17. So with the most important details out of the way, let's go through the rest of the components, mainly the motherboard and everything connected to it where they're advertising THX spatial surround speakers. And these speakers, they sound decent. Don't expect to run house parties on them or deep bass, but they will do the job to listen to music or have clear Skype conversations. Though speaking of the onboard audio itself, this is one thing I like to test out. And here is where laptops do fall behind in terms of most of the time, I have tested some laptops that have really good integrations of onboard audio, but in this case, the Razer Blade Pro 17 does miss the mark with onboard audio, at least from the tests I did here, and I did run from two separate devices on the headphone out, and that was getting some results that were just all over the place. The crosstalk was mediocre at best, so you will want to, if you are serious about audio, you will want to get a separate DAC amp solution in my opinion, which of course might chew up one of those three full-size USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A USBs. And speaking of those USB 3.2 Gen 2 speeds, they were absolutely fine. We're getting up to 800 uh, megabytes per second copy speeds from a USB 3.2 Type C device. And they've got also two USB 3.2 Type C Thunderbolt ports and a UHS-3 SD card reader. And then the last thing is an HDMI out, which is also a 2.1. So you can hook that up to a juicy 4K 120Hz OLED or 8K 60. And then to top all this off, we've got a 720p Hello webcam at the top of the laptop right here. And then Razer have their Synapse software included and pre-installed on this laptop from the get-go. And I will say the software will allow you to change all the keyboard and the individual keys to the different RGB lighting itself. They do use scissor switches too. And the touchpad was doing a great job of being very accurate to use if you're on the go. Of course, I'd always wanna use a separate mouse when I'm serious about using any type of computer, whether it's a laptop or a desktop. But in this case, the keyboard was very nice to type on. It was doing a great job in terms of not getting overheated because the cooling system did a good job from the underside. But on that note of RGB, you also get the option to save and create your own custom profiles and you can integrate different RGB ecosystems into the Razer Synapse software. For instance, if you've got Philips Hue lighting, you can connect it and control it from your laptop. And with all the facts laid out on the table, it's time to give you guys a recommendation on how I see things with the Razer Blade Pro 17. And the model that we've got here, I will say one thing, and that is that I was impressed with the overall quality and how it performed in games with the noise and the temperatures. They've done a great job from the get-go. The only thing I can critique really on this laptop or two things would be the onboard audio and also the laptop's monitor, the IPS monitor, and that it wasn't 100% sRGB coverage and the response times could use a little bit of a boost. But now to answer that killer question directly, and that is at three and a half thousand Aussie dollars or 2,600 US dollars, is the Razer Blade Pro 17 a goer? And after what I've experienced here today, testing this thing from top to bottom, I do think it is a goer. Just keep in mind, when it comes to the world of laptops, you are going to be paying a premium than you would as opposed to a desktop PC. So I can't really calculate how much of a premium you would be paying with the laptop. Because if I was to build a desktop and also get a 165 Hertz IPS display, 
and then the keyboard and mouse and everything else, it would be coming in close, especially in the pricing of nowadays with peripherals and everything else, it would be actually coming close to the price of this laptop. But of course, you would be getting more performance out of the desktop version. But that being said, the price tag is a steep ask. And so if you are concerned about certain things with this laptop, then do go back and watch the review because I believe we've covered and hit the nail on the head for everything with this laptop. And with that aside, I hope you guys enjoyed this review. If you did, be sure to hit that like button for us. Also let us know in the comments section below, what do you think of the Razer Blade Pro 17? Was there anything you would add or take away personally? And with that aside, we do have here the question of the day, which actually relates to laptops. I don't usually get asked laptop questions much, but one came in here from Rayon Lee and they ask, my PC is RTX 2060 Max-Q Core i5 10300H, eight gigabytes of DDR4 RAM. Is it a high-end or low-end laptop? It comes with hard disk drive space available and dual channel RAM, but I'm not upgrading yet. So this laptop, I'd say it's a mid-range laptop. It's not too bad. The specs will still play games very well in 2021. Personally, I would try to get 16 gigabytes of DDR4 in that laptop just for a smoother gaming experience, especially if you've got other things installed on the laptop, but it's not such a bad spec from the get-go. And in fact, speaking of the RTX 2000 series, you can get some really good deals on laptops, even from Razer themselves, where they offer an RTX 2070 laptop with a 4K OLED display and that was going for around, I think, 1800 US dollars. So if you are a content creator, you may wish to check out something like their previous gen models where you can get a really good deal, at least from the pricing I was seeing before I did this review. Hope that answers that question. And if you guys have stayed this far and you're enjoying that Tech Yes content, be sure to hit that sub button, ring that bell, and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace out for now. Bye.